The Crusade of Varna, a monumental event in shaping Europe as we leave the medieval era and enter the early modern era. Yet who has heard of it? Perhaps a couple of EU4 enthusiasts, as EU4 starts a day after the defeat of the Crusade, but apart from that, is relatively unknown. But its importance must not be understated. For decades, the Ottomans had been encroaching on the weakening Byzantine Empire. But despite the Byzantine Empire losing much of its power and prestige, it was still acting as the legitimate successor state to the Roman Empire and still held the massively important city of Constantinople. At the same time, the expansion of the Muslim Ottoman Empire further and further into the Balkans began to worry the rest of Europe. It appeared that soon, the Ottoman Sultan may take Constantinople, throwing open the gates for further Ottoman expansion into Europe. This fear was intensified by issues in Hungary. Hungary was facing internal conflict over who was to become the next monarch of the kingdom. Eventually, the position was filled by Vladislav III, who just happened to be the king of Poland as well, while Vladislav's brother Casimir ruled the neighboring Grand Duchy of Lithuania, meaning that their Jagiellon dynasty controlled this truly massive amount of Eastern Europe. With Vladislav as the Hungarian king, internal peace was temporarily restored. Pope Eugene IV decided that it was time for a crusade against the Ottoman Empire. This crusade would mainly be led by the vast lands of Vladislav III, but would also see support from Bohemia, Wallachia, Bosnia, Serbia, the Papal States, the Teutonic Order, as well as limited support from Burgundy, Venice and Ragusa, creating, on paper, this massive coalition against the Ottoman Empire. The Crusaders made some early gains, pushing deep into Ottoman-controlled Bulgaria. Eventually, the two forces collided into the concluding Battle of Varna. The Ottoman victory was devastating for the Crusaders. The papal legate to the Crusade was killed, as well as most of the Crusading armies, and perhaps most devastatingly, King Vladislav himself. With this defeat, the Crusade scattered and was practically over. The results of this Crusade were immense. The death of Vladislav entered the short existence of this Polish-Hungarian Commonwealth, as the succession of Poland and Hungary now came into question. The Ottomans themselves, while they did lose some lands in Serbia, came out of this war emboldened. Soon, they would push back into Serbia and prepare for the conquest of Constantinople. Without a powerful figure like Vladislav to lead a new crusade, most European states stood idly by as the Ottomans took Constantinople. Meanwhile, new power struggles in Hungary set out the path to future Hungarian weakness to Ottoman invasion, as Hungary was in no position to be the bulwark for Christianity against the Ottomans, paving the way for the continent-spanning Ottoman Empire. But what if this changed? What if, in 1444, the crusade against the Ottomans succeeded, and the Ottoman Empire was thrown out of the Balkans in the 15th century, saving the Byzantine Empire? So, what do we need to have this scenario happen? Well, realistically, they couldn't without significantly more help. Despite what you may think from this map, the Ottomans actually outnumbered the crusading forces by 2 or 3 to 1. Even if the Crusaders won some more minor victories, the Ottomans always had the luxury of falling back and regrouping, likely resulting in an eventual Ottoman victory. But that's boring. So instead, we'll have the Christian soldiers in the Ottoman army switch sides during the Crusade, more Christian nations send small armies to bolster the Crusading armies, the Crusaders win a couple of minor engagements at the start of the war, but crucially, the Crusaders score a lucky kill on the Ottoman Sultan Murad II, routing the Ottoman army, after which the now disorganized Ottomans abandon much of the Balkans. What's next? Immediately, the Byzantines would likely come into action both militarily and diplomatically, sending envoys to the Crusaders to discuss the future of the Balkan while moving soldiers into now sparsely defended Ottoman lands. As the successor state to Rome, and with relatively good relations between the Byzantines and the Catholic world at the time, the Byzantines would likely be able to reclaim the Greek lands surrounding the Aegean Sea. Furthermore, Skanderbeg would fully solidify his independent Albanian state, while Serbia would be restored and Wallachia expanded. What's left is Bulgaria, where as far as I know, there was no concrete plan as to what should happen to it. I consider it likely that Vladislav, the main sponsor of the crusade, either picks a family member or close ally to become the king of Bulgaria under clear influence of Vladislav. And this is the map when the dust settles. The Byzantine Empire restored to somewhat of a respectable state, and Vladislav's influence almighty in Eastern Europe, while a wounded Ottoman Empire is distracted by the other Turkish tribes in Anatolia. Now, obviously, as I always say in medieval and early modern alternate history videos, 
it's impossible to realistically continue to predict forests from here, as the death and succession of a single monarch can completely warp timelines. But I will do my best to sketch at least one potential future scenario. To start with the most impacted nation, what would happen to the Ottomans? Well, their monarch would be dead, replaced with the 11 year old Mehmed II. Their leadership would be shaken, their Balkan territories lost, and they were in skirmishes with other Turkish tribes in Anatolia. All in all, the Ottomans were not in a good spot, but they aren't hopeless either. The Ottomans became a powerful force in history, not by just luck, but by virtue, as they were on the forefront of military and administrative developments, which made them become a very modern nation by the standards of the time. The Ottomans, from their outposts in Anatolia, would by no means be destroyed, despite being heavily crippled. There is little threat to the Ottoman Anatolian lands, and the Ottomans can at least become a powerful regional player from Anatolia. And only time will tell if this alternate Ottomans would manage to recover their losses. From there, we move on to the Byzantines, who by 1444 were a minor power, and even the restoration of Greece wouldn't change this fact. Furthermore, after decades of weakness, the Byzantines were discussing joining the Byzantine church back in line with the Roman Catholic one paving the way for large-scale reunification of the Christian churches. Had a Catholic-led crusade succeeded in throwing the Ottomans from the Balkans, the end of the schism may very well have been accomplished, and coupled with Vladislav's new influence over the Balkans, it is very possible that Catholicism takes over in the Balkan again. So, let's now move on to one of the biggest changes in this ultimate history, and one very few people know about, Vladislav III. Vladislav became king of Poland at 10 years old, added the Kingdom of Hungary to his domains at 16, while his younger brother was in control over the neighboring Lithuania. The Jagiellon dynasty now occupied most of Eastern Europe. What did this young ruler, set up with possibly the strongest realm in Europe at the time do? He went on a crusade and died by the hands of the Ottomans at 20 years of age. The ramification of this single death cannot be understated. Poland lost its monarch and eventually crowned Vladislav's younger brother as king, paving the way for the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as we know it. Hungary lost its monarch as well, at a time where even Vladislav's rulership was already contested in the kingdom. Hungary then became embroiled in dynastic conflicts between, among others, John Hunyadi and the Habsburg dynasty, allowing the Ottomans to gobble up Serbia, Bosnia and eventually Hungary itself. Vladislav was only 20 when he died at Varna. Had he been successful against the Ottomans, he may very well have been able to consolidate his position against the Hungarian nobility, creating a Polish-Hungarian kingdom with potential for the future addition of Lithuania as well, consolidating the Jagiellon Empire in this Eastern European blob. But before you get too excited, sadly, I have to insert realism here to crush these dreams of a destined Eastern European juggernaut. Vladislav would have many issues to contend with before anything close to this would come to pass. Both Poland and Hungary still had very powerful nobilities seeking to influence and subvert the monarchs for their own benefit. Vladislav's victory over the Ottomans would increase his prestige and popularity, but that doesn't change the fact that if his nobility senses weakness, they won't hesitate to work against him, or even push for the splitting of the kingdoms or replacement of Vladislav with a more weak-willed king. So I will, sadly, not say that a Hungarian-Polish-Lithuanian superstate was an inevitability thanks to the victory at Varna, even though I would really want it to be. Especially because in our timeline, Vladislav couldn't prove himself as an administrator, as he inherited an empire, went to war, and then died. Who is to say how Vladislav would tackle the issues ahead of him? A strong Eastern European superstate is just as likely as the Jagiellon Empire falling into disrepair. Then, the start of the Renaissance is often credited to the fall of the Byzantines, leading to Greek immigrants coming to Italy with new knowledge, sparking new influence in ancient texts, but universities, ancient knowledge, and a revitalization of the arts had been well on their way before the fall of Byzantium. Not to mention that in this alternate timeline, the Byzantine integration into the Catholic world would likely allow transfer of knowledge as well. I don't see how the overall course of the Renaissance would be drastically altered. All in all, the changes of this alternate history are massive, but they are also unpredictable and very dependent on the luck and skill of the alternate Ottoman and Polish rulers. A massive Jagiellon Empire spreading from the Balkans to Russia is possible, but alternatively, the complete fracture of the empire is possible as well. Similarly, the Ottomans may reform and build up a powerful power base, from where they can still become the predominant Muslim power, potentially even returning to the Balkans somewhere down the line, 
or they can splinter from further Christian action and instability in leadership, pushing the Ottomans into a position of a moderate regional power at best. But despite the exacts being unclear, the proven changes are already huge. The Byzantines survived, Catholicism has been spread to much of the Balkans, and importantly, the Ottoman rise to European domination has been avoided or at least significantly delayed and weakened. Since any short-term return of the Ottomans to the Balkans would now be opposed by the Polish state and other Catholic realms. My personal headcanon for this scenario would be that Vladislav is a terrific ruler, reducing the power of the Hungarian and Polish nobilities and consolidating his Eastern European Empire. But by judging the historical strength of the Polish and Hungarian nobilities, I consider it, sadly, more likely that eventually the Jagellon Empire would either fall or become heavily influenced by its nobility against its own interests. But this is where I'll end this scenario. Let me know in the comments what I missed, if you agree, and where you think the scenario goes from here. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing and leaving a like and a comment to help this video against the algorithm. A special thanks to Lord Atlantean, Yoshi, Jonathan White, Predator, Grayshot151, John, Brzemek, Petrotsky, Firelord Marklin, Dingleberg and Slayer for supporting me on Patreon. Consider supporting me there for about two weeks of early access and a shout out at the end of every video. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.